Aloha! Welcome to our first episode of our talk story. And I'm Liana, I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Akahiao Nature Institute. And here with me is Christy Kay, one of my best friends. We've known each other since childhood and we've come a long way. So I'm really pleased to have her here with me today to talk more about her experience in the education field and what inspired her learning, what she's done since kindergarten. Since <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to getting more into that. So thank you, Christy, for joining us. Yeah, thanks today. for having me. I'm excited to be a part of this. I'm really excited to talk more. So I want to share a little bit more about Christy before I hand it over. I would describe Christy as someone who is passionate for learning enthusiastic about life. She's experienced more than anyone I know, and she isn't afraid to take the bull by the horns, live boldly, and squeeze every little bit of juice out of life. Mm -hmm. And I mean that. <laughs> um, so Christy grew up on the big island of Hawaii, where she learned firsthand about the importance of preserving culture, building community, and cultivating an appreciation for Aina and for our earth. She spent several, several years volunteering internationally on environmental restoration projects, wildlife rehabilitation, and disaster relief. Christy graduated from Northern Arizona University with her Bachelor of Science in Education. She's been honored with several awards for her lesson planning and teaching abilities, including the first place prize for the 2013 Imagine Arizona Contest for the creation and implementation of a month-long unit on the Southwest Native Americans. She also received the 2014 SETI Teacher Award for Sustainability Curriculum, which consisted of collaboratively planning and executing a culminating academic and character building experience, which consisted of um, a field trip, a week-long annual trip for fifth graders to the Arizona and New Mexico for the purpose of visiting Native American historic sites. Christy values diversity and having a global perspective, so she took a hiatus for a while to travel, and I can proudly say for her, she's independently traveled to 81 countries all across the world. Good job, Christy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and during this time, this remarkable time and challenging experience, she cultivated excellent interpersonal skills in communication, leadership, and cross-cultural understanding. She's passionate about inspiring youth to attain a global perspective and the strength of character that will allow them to excel in their academics, their personal life, and their future careers. Christy now owns and operates a business that tailors education to her students' needs. Welcome, Christy. Thank you. What a lovely introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I loved reading it, so. Um, to start off, can you just tell us a little bit more about growing up on the big island and you know what inspired your career and maybe some of your experience volunteering? Sure, sure. so I grew up in the rainforest of Mountain View on the, the big island. Place the on the planet. <laughs> yes. Uh, with cokey frogs in the background and lush greenery everywhere where the only role was get back before the sun sets, yeah. you know? <laughs> so my childhood consisted of, you know, not being on my iPad. I was outside climbing trees, riding my bike through the neighborhood, you know, like pretending that I was a magician and I would um, fix the trees and restore them. And my childhood included a lot of imagination and a lot of outdoor playing. Mm -hmm. And that really got me inspired to think about how the outdoors can really cultivate imag imagination and play in children. Mm -hmm. uh, in college, I decided that I wanted to go to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So this had been the place growing up in Hawaii that I thought was a bit similar because they pronounce their words in a similar fashion. They have a very unique culture. 
you know, they do the haka to intimidate their opponents, and that's something that... It's very intimidating. <laughs> right, and I had seen that growing up in Hawaii at the football games yeah. with, yeah. you know, the football players doing the haka. I love that. Yeah, love that. Right? Yeah. So this was the place I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And upon being there, I got involved with conservation work. Mm -hmm. So just like in Hawaii where we talk about preserving um, the wildlife and the plants and how important they are and mm -hmm. getting rid of um, non-native plants that are introduced. That's the work that I did in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So we were eradicating non-native species, pulling up plants, planting um, new trees. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a time where we went to school, we talked about conservation efforts mm -hmm. and saving water, mm -hmm. what kids can do. And then we actually took them on a field trip into the forest and all of the students planted trees. Wow. So in that day, we planted thousands of trees in New wow. Zealand. Wow, how cool is that? That sounds epic. Right, and this is the kind of learning that I love, hands-on learning where mm -hmm. the kids get to get outside. They're mm -hmm. not just hearing someone speak. They're not just looking at pictures. They're getting their hands dirty. Mm -hmm. They're being involved. Mm -hmm. And this just reminded me of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I knew that it was going to make a difference because mm -hmm. they're seeing firsthand how what they're doing is contributing to not just their life, but future generations. Mm -hmm. Like their children and their children's children will get to enjoy this force that they're creating by what they're planting today. Yeah. And although they might not see the outcome you know, the beautiful, tall trees, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. their children will see it. Yeah, investing into the future, right. multi-generational, amazing. Right. Yeah. So I kept, uh, you know, mm -hmm. getting into the field of education because mm -hmm. I want to help people and mm -hmm. have kids have all types of experience mm -hmm. that will help them to learn. Mm -hmm. But I got into several more conservation work type of jobs, like summer jobs in my breaks where I would mm -hmm go to Mississippi and do rehabilitation of homes that were destroyed from the hurricane. Hurricane um, Katrina. Yes, yeah. yes. And there's neighborhoods within Mississippi where there hadn't been a lot of help from the government due to uh, social impacts or, you know, there, there's- Are they kind of cut off? from areas too, like were areas isolated due to the hurricane that people couldn't access? Yes, and there were homes that were destroyed and they didn't have the resources to rebuild. And a lot of times that was happening in uh, African-American neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So we went into those neighborhoods and with the people who didn't have the money mm -hmm. to rebuild their homes, help them. Mm -hmm to rebuild. I mean, we're having high school students mm -hmm. rebuild their homes, so yeah. you can see that these people just want help yeah. from anywhere. Yeah. But it's that hands-on learning, that cultural immersion, learning about mm -hmm. other people's struggles, where they come from, what they've been through, and learning to connect, not only with nature, but with people too, mm -hmm. with the people who live in that land mm -hmm. and what they've gone through. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really incredible. Oh, wow. Okay. I can pull a lot from that <laughs> experience. So, okay, let's start with Hurricane Katrina. Um, so you, when you got there, you saw all of the damage that was done. Yes. It had, it had been a few years since mm -hmm. Hurricane Katrina, but there was still mm -hmm. lots of damage that I think people were like, okay, well, we fixed most things, mm -hmm. so we don't need to get into the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. But that nitty gritty is people's livelihood in their homes. Yeah. And we don't want anyone to be forgotten. No, no one's forgotten. And while you were doing that, so you, you rebuilt homes and you learned skills, like construction skills, carpentry skills? Yeah, so yeah. the company that I worked for hires carpenters. Mm -hmm. And during the first week of training, they mm -hmm. teach the leaders, so mm -hmm. I was one of the leaders, mm -hmm those carpentry skills. So mm -hmm. we're using electrical saws, we're mm -hmm. learning how to drill, mm -hmm. how to hammer, mm -hmm. um, really how to build, mm -hmm. so that in the following week when the high schoolers come, mm -hmm. now all of us are trained carpenters yeah. and can teach these high schoolers and lead them. How cool. So yeah. 
we are leading the high schoolers because we really want it to be them who's contributing and making a difference. We're kind of overseeing it, making sure that they're safe, making sure that they have the support and guidance they need. Mm -hmm. But firsthand, we want them to have the experience mm -hmm. of what it's like to give back to a community mm -hmm. and what that feels like. Mm -hmm. It's a very empowering experience for the students and mm -hmm. the leaders. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to do disaster relief. So that's a really inspiring story. And I hope that sometime <laughs> uh, in the future that I will because we're facing so many natural disasters mm -hmm. today and it seems like the occurrence of of them happening or just back to back to back would is that something you're interested in doing again yes in fact this past summer i went to the british virgin islands mm -hmm. and as you probably know virgin gorda in the british virgin islands was completely devastated by hurricane irma mm -hmm. the winds were crazy speeds i mean ships were flipping upside down um, shipment containers, mm -hmm. you know, that are t tons heavy, mm -hmm. were flipping around, homes completely wiped out. And this is a place in our world where you're on a small island, everything is shipped, mm -hmm. so you can imagine that things there are very expensive. Mm -hmm. But yet, more than 70% of the people who live on Virgin Gorda make $6 and change an hour. Mm -hmm. So you're spending anywhere from one hour's wage to three hours wage for a bottle of shampoo, mm -hmm. normal things to live your life. Mm -hmm. So these people whose homes are destroyed, mm -hmm. it's not like they just rebuild. Mm -hmm. They don't have the funds or the money. So they really rely on, you know, disaster relief groups like the company I work for to come in and have high schoolers again, help them. They're, they're desperate for mm -hmm. this help, you know? And what was really interesting this summer, um, I was the program lead. So I directed the leaders yeah. and assigned the projects, went around to the community and figured out where did the community need the most help. Mm -hmm. And then figured out projects that my students and leaders could do to fulfill those needs. Mm -hmm. So we were working with different schools on the island. Mm -hmm. You know, we plastered walls, mm -hmm. we painted them so that the children, when they returned to the school, mm -hmm. could paint murals mm -hmm. on the walls. Mm -hmm. We dug trenches for irrigation. Mm -hmm. uh, we did beach cleanups because you would look at the beach and it's just piled and piled with metal sheets and wood, rotten wood. Mm -hmm. And one thing that was really interesting mm -hmm. is that that stuff to them is not trash. Mm -hmm. And you really learn that one person's trash is another person's treasure. Mm -hmm. Because if the typical American had seen this, they would have probably just put it to the dump. Yeah. But we saved these pieces that we thought were savable. Mm -hmm. We would saw off the rotten part and keep the other part. Mm -hmm. and people in the community want this wood. We use that wood to make dog shelters, dog houses mm -hmm. for the stray dogs, mm -hmm. while also educating community members about um, getting their pets spayed and neutered so that mm -hmm. you know there wouldn't be these dogs running around or these yeah. cats running around. Yeah. So we dealt with a lot of issues in the community, mm -hmm. um, education, animal welfare, rebuilding, cleanup, mm -hmm. and it was really neat because another big part of all of this is cultural immersion. Mm -hmm. Getting to know the people, their needs, their struggles, what's their daily life like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you get so connected when you actually stay in a place mm -hmm. and you dive deep. Yeah, yeah, like in Hawaii, I'm thinking, you know, people and place are never to be removed from one another like people are the place the place are the people and it sounds like the idea of sustainability there in the british virgin islands comes out of the idea out of necessity like yes those are the resources they have they're utilizing what's available mm -hmm. and it sounds like there's not a whole lot there um so i i can't imagine you know what life would be like for them if groups um, these service groups and high school students um, weren't there to right. help. Um, 
And I imagine that that experience is also really impactful for the students. Like, what was their experience like? And did they walk away feeling, you know, changed? And you know, what did they express to you about it? They expressed so much appreciation for the culture. You know, it's a culture where it's a small island and everyone knows each other. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't know someone, mm -hmm. every car that passes you in the street will honk at you to say, mm -hmm. hi, yeah. how are you? How's it going? Yeah. And they're so excited for the kids to be there. And that made the kids excited to want to be there and want to help the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a time where a student had a sore throat and community members knew this and started bringing local plants, mm -hmm. uh, like making this thing called bush tea, you mm -hmm. know, that is supposed to soothe the sore throat. And the students are so excited mm -hmm. to learn about something different, you know, than just taking a cough drop. Some plant medicine, Some, local plant medicine. Exactly. And, you know, working in the school and seeing a project from start to finish, mm -hmm. They so thoroughly enjoyed that mm -hmm. because they didn't just start something and then leave. Mm -hmm. They worked at it day after day and also learned the reward of hard work itself mm -hmm. and knowing again that they're going to make an impact even if they don't see the children enjoying what they did. Mm -hmm they know that they've done something. They've helped local farmers. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people in the British Virgin Islands grow their own food and use that to eat so they don't have to buy things at the supermarket. But then they also sell to produce farms. And you know, you'll like drive around, like we go to a local farmer's market in mm -hmm. Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So we would drive around and just stop on the side of the road and mm -hmm. there'd be someone called like the pineapple guy. Yeah. And we'd pick up pineapples from him. And just this daily interaction, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the kids felt so fulfilled knowing that they knew where their food was coming from. Yeah. Um, they saw, you know, they harvested sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. You know, they really got their hands dirty. And the community members would come to us and show their appreciation and mm -hmm. tell us how meaningful it was and mm -hmm. explain why the work was important. And I think without that connection of the community mm -hmm. explaining, maybe their tasks wouldn't seem so important mm -hmm. because to them, they're like, yeah, we painted a wall. Mm -hmm. But knowing that what they did restored a community, mm -hmm. the kids left feeling like they wanted to do more community service work, mm -hmm. that they wanted to get involved. I heard stu students say that never again would they forget to take the cap off a bottle before they recycled it? <laughs> this was drilled That's into win. them. That's a win. You know, they learned about composting. We had all different type of recycling bins, like mm -hmm. for plastic, mm -hmm. um, for paper. We had, you know, every scrap of food mm -hmm. we saved and composted. Mm -hmm. And we created compost bins mm -hmm. out of that wood that we did from the beach cleanup mm -hmm. and painted that compost bin and then use the compost to make new soil. Mm -hmm. So the students are learning about the cycle. And I think that kind of learning, it's not just a memorization of facts. That's going to be lifelong. Absolutely. Yeah. So even if they, they went there knowing little at all or nothing, they probably walked away with a plethora of knowledge and skills, how to interact with other social groups and communities right. and it sounds like what made a really big difference is that the local people were very welcoming yes um appreciative they were engaged with your group and they had lots of aloha yes um, i can see like maybe in other places where the culture or the people are less um welcoming to outsiders that creates a rift and the entire experience can be completely different and and I think that in turn impacts those students too. And it sounds like it was so meaningful and purposeful for them that they're, they're excited about continuing that type of work. And I mean, they say that volunteer work amongst many other things helps us live longer, happier lives. And that's one of the most like important key aspects is giving back and mm -hmm. being in service. So 
That's so inspiring to hear that story. Good yeah. job, Christy. Thank you. you a great job. Um, just to add to that, yeah. a lot of these kids that came to this program come from very privileged backgrounds where they have, you know, the best education and, you know, their parents um, have great jobs. So just giving them the ability to see how others live mm -hmm. and how others struggle, I find that so important just mm -hmm. to be able to put these students into someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't sleep in hotels while we were there. We slept with 25 students in a room on little mats on the floor, you know, mm -hmm. and this alone was a different experience. Mm -hmm. And the whole point was that we are going to live how the locals live. Mm -hmm. We're not going to come in and stay in fancy hotels while everyone else doesn't even have a roof over their head, literally because it's gone mm -hmm. because of Hurricane Irma. Mm -hmm. So we came in and you know, there were days where we didn't have water mm -hmm. because we were staying at the top of a mountain and the water pressure doesn't go up. Mm -hmm. And this was new for the students. This was a struggle, this was challenging. But I also believe that a bit of struggle mm -hmm. is very good for someone's education in learning how to live in the world. And character. Sounds like Absolutely. It's a huge character building experience for them. Absolutely. I mean, really um, learning what they value and um, finding that inner strength. Right. To per persevere through challenging times like that. Right. Right. Awesome. That's so awesome. Um, so I spoke a little bit about how you have received awards yeah. early on in your career. You came blasting out as one of the top teachers in <laughs> Arizona after graduating. Um, and I'd love for you to share more about, um, what you've done with Native American studies and the award that you received. Sure. So in my first year of teaching, I worked at a school called Sanawa Middle School in Flagstaff, Arizona. And Arizona is a state that has the second largest Native American population in the United States. So Native American studies are very important to anyone living there to understand their history. Mm -hmm. As you said, the people and the land are connected. The people are the land, the land is the people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started thinking about how in the standards, we don't go that much in depth about that history. And growing up in Hawaii, you know, you learn about Hawaiian culture, mm -hmm. native plants, wildlife, the language, mm -hmm. right? The history. And I thought that was a piece that was missing from these students' education. Like, do they know where they come from and who came before mm -hmm. and how this land was created? Um, so I designed a month long curriculum on Native Americans, starting with the ancient Native Americans, like the Hokam, mm -hmm. and talking about how they created these very advanced irrigation canals mm -hmm. and how we're still using their technology mm -hmm. today with mm -hmm. our advanced technology. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think sometimes people think that since we have technology now that we're very advanced and, you know, mm -hmm. but looking back, our ancestors were so smart in the way that they utilized the land to meet mm -hmm. their needs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, growing crops, using mm -hmm. the farm animals, you know, even today with their artwork, they use sheep's wool and create these beautiful, beautiful rugs and they create it on this loom mm -hmm. and they dye the wool mm -hmm. with plants. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is so natural and so connected and it's a really beautiful culture mm -hmm. because they have an appreciation for everything that the land gives them. Mm -hmm. Like if they are to eat an animal, they express gratitude mm -hmm. for that animal's life mm -hmm. before they use it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I learned in Hawaii that's very important as well. Utilizing the land and being grateful mm -hmm. for what the land gives you. Mm -hmm. uh, so during this lesson plan, you know, I incorporated art. We did whole come coil pottery. Mm -hmm. 
and actually glaze their own pottery using the same method that the ancient Native Americans did. We listened to Native American music. We tried doing um, loom weaving, mm -hmm. right? We watched videos of the Hocom irrigation canals, like someone, uh, you know, a scientist going to that site and looking at the technology and explaining it. Mm -hmm. So I really felt like that gave the students maybe some peace knowing, mm -hmm. wow, the, my, the land that I live in has a lot of history mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some pride in where they live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, what I'm hearing is um, from all of your experiences, the connection you've had with nature, but also sharing that experience and really connecting to nature and culture um, in many different ways and it sounds like that's that was a really rare opportunity for them to learn some of these ancient practices and crafts right that they may have never known about before right um, and that I, I really truly believe needs to be honored so it's a beautiful lesson plan that you created Thank you. Um, and it's really important to know our history the history of the land the people that have come before us and there's so many similarities between Hawaiian culture and Native American culture in, in that way where they were so connected to the world around them, their environment, um, that it cultivated their, um, their kinship with the land, the water, the skies, the ocean, the, you know, everything, the animals and the plants. Um, and do you think that today there, there's been a loss of that connection to nature? I think so. That and I've seen with students as well. Yeah, especially with, you know, more and more technology. Students are spending a lot of time on the screen. Mm -hmm. I don't see children doing what I did as a kid where they just climb trees in the backyard and, mm -hmm. and you know, use their imagination and get outside and look at the plants and, and dig in the soil. You know, kids are playing games on their iPad. And of course, there's specialized schools that recognize the importance of outdoor learning mm -hmm. and get students outside as much as possible. But I think that we need to remember that technology is a tool mm -hmm. that we can use, mm -hmm. but that our land is the best teacher. Absolutely, absolutely. I. I always say that nature has been my greatest teacher. Like it's allowed me to learn my greatest lessons through hardships and challenges. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, for that, it, it, I, we, that alone, you know, deserves our respect and um, for all that it provides as well. And just kind of talking more about imagination um, and being outdoors. So that's kind of what we have seen as well and experienced with our small groups at Akahiao. That, you know, after the pandemic, all students really wanted to do was be outside again and yeah. play and how important that is for the development of a child, um, for their social learning, social emotional learning. And we found that the conversations they end up having together outside of the walls but in nature are um, way beyond anything that we could have prompted them with and you know witnessing them cultivate their own discussions and and how much they know these days at such a young age because right. we're in this age of technology and information it's really incredible to see them forming their own opinions about social issues, pol politics, and you know things that maybe we didn't talk about until we were much older. Right. Um, so I feel like also being in nature stimulates a lot of that, um, a, a lot of thinking as well, mm -hmm. um, imagination, and also like feeling aspects of, like one thing that we focus on is kilo and observation and how um, our ancient ancestors developed that skill over time and acquired so much knowledge of the world around us and passed that on for thousands and thousands of years and how we've forgotten so much of that. So we really like to instill observation um, into everything we do um, as our base of learning. Okay. 
Um, it's really interesting. Yeah, so doing it like, you know, ancient Hawaiians did and um, I'm sure Native Americans as well, like you're talking about their um, irrigation canals and that technology, I mean, it's, it works. It's been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's stayed true um, to what it is. And sometimes it seems like the, the more practical applications um, and techniques are the ones that outlive maybe right. some, our old cell phone that we threw away and is no right. longer, you know, around. Um, so it's interesting to see where technology will go and with its advancement, um, you know, how it can benefit us if we use it correctly, but also how it can impede us from connecting with yes. nature, spending time outside. Um, one really startling fact I came across um, this last year, um, students were only spending seven minutes outdoors. Wow. And the rest of the time was indoors. Wow. Um, and so that, to me what needs to be changed right like you were saying we grew up outdoors like we didn't know anything else but so quickly in the next generation you know they're growing up um in different times yeah and and as you're saying with the pandemic and being inside not only did they not have time physically outside but they had a lack of that connectedness mm -hmm. connectedness with others which a lot of learning happens with that connection, with the sharing of mm -hmm. ideas. Like it's not enough just to know something on your own. We're social creatures. We're social creatures and as you said, like the ancient Hawaiians passed down their knowledge by connecting, by speaking to one another, mm -hmm. by sharing what they know. It's not enough to know it yourself, mm -hmm. right? So when you're saying that you've observed these students outside in nature having these free form discussions and how they're so advanced that's because they're allowed then in that space to be open mm -hmm. and to use their imagination and to bounce ideas off of one another. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And to build upon those ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I say something, you add to that, mm -hmm. I get a new idea, I add to that, and all of a sudden we have an amazing idea mm -hmm. that may or may not work, but learning is all about trying, mm -hmm. failing, trying again. Mm -hmm until it works mm -hmm. and then improving mm -hmm. beautifully said yeah and being okay to express our thoughts too without feeling like so confined you know like oh right i'm just gonna keep it to myself but really allowing them to share is just as important right and sometimes you know kids might not have the right words mm -hmm. so maybe they wouldn't share that in a typical classroom because they mm -hmm. wouldn't know how to express it mm -hmm. but being in nature feeling relaxed and comfortable they'll just say it the way that they know how yeah and someone else might have the words and yeah. help expand on that yeah. idea yeah exactly we're all here to help each other right so it has been really difficult um through the pandemic especially for children and i want to pose this question to you um, because this has never happened in human history before, um, especially within the education system, how do you see this past year with all the students learning um, through virtual classrooms? How do you think that's going to affect them in their future? Like, um, do you think, I'm sure some students have fallen behind because parents have taken on so much of that responsibility as well you know, to teach at home and right. um, some of them feel isolated. Uh, so how do you, how, how, do you think they're gonna respond? How are they gonna respond to this when they're older? Well, I think that a big concern is the social and emotional aspect, like not having that time to be with others and learn how to work with others. You know, and we've even seen it change in the workforce. Like a lot of our jobs now are remote jobs, right? Yes. People have realized, oh, you don't need to come in to work. You don't need to be with other people. You can just do it all online. And although at times that might be really convenient, I, I wonder what are we missing? Yeah. Are we missing that connection? Are we going to start to separate from each other and just yeah. feel independent? Yeah. And in doing so, we're not collaborating and sharing ideas. So I, I don't believe that we'll get as far alone as we would together. 
I agree. I absolutely agree. Yeah, hearing you say that, um, there are the benefits, of course, of working remote. You get to spend more time with your family mm -hmm. um, and things like that. But it is a little scary to think of the separation and missing that connectedness and where that's going to take us in the future and if we're going to evolve to be more uh, solo type of people. Right. And I mean, when we're choosing like to hang with our family and our friends, we're usually choosing people who are probably like minded. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's benefits to that because they inspire you to keep going. Mm -hmm. But it's essential to learning and human development and working with people and understanding others to meet people that you disagree with, yeah. who have an opposing view, and to listen to them and respect them and to find common ground. Mm -hmm. And that is not something that you can learn online. Mm -hmm. That is something that has to be done through connecting mm -hmm. and realizing, wow, this person has so many good traits, but now they've just said something that I disagree with. Mm -hmm. But I have to continue working with them. Mm -hmm. How do I move forward? Mm -hmm. And that's essential mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we're not all going to have the same ideas about how to live this life. Yeah. And we see that, you know, in our government, in friendships, like, if you're so black and white, there's separation. Mm -hmm. And we do there's not need- right and a wrong. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we do not need that separation. We need to find common ground. Yeah. Meet in the middle and listen to each other with respect. Mm -hmm. And that has to be done by going out into the world and meeting all types of people. Mm -hmm. Not just the types that you connect with yeah. and agree with getting out of your comfort zone, exactly. out of your comfortability uh, to learn different narratives and perspectives, mm -hmm. philosophies, worldviews. You could say getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Exactly, exactly. Um, so before we get into your experience of traveling, which you kind of ended with there, I think it's a good time to go into that. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I had a question I wanted to ask you. So. Um, there are a lot of questions I wanted to ask you, but I, <laughs> like, I just forgot the one that I wanted to. Um, let's see. All right, we'll jump into traveling. Okay. Maybe the question will come back to me. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that Christy has traveled extensively internationally. Um, and why, what inspired you to pursue on this journey of travel and immersing yourself in other cultures and what was that like for you and you know what have you taken from it how has it helped your your career and education sure so I've always had a desire to travel and to learn about other people and how they live and it was very scary at first because you know, growing up on Big Island, when I go to the store, I run into people I know. And the idea of traveling independently, where I'm going to know no one, and maybe not even understand the language, was extremely terrifying. And that alone motivated me. Because mm -hmm. I'm a person that loves challenge, and loves getting uncomfortable, and getting through it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yes, let's do this. And it was the most remarkable experience of my entire life. I learned so much in those years that I didn't learn in school. Mm -hmm. I truly learned, not just heard the words or memorized, learned how to connect with all types of people, mm -hmm. learning how other people lived, what their values were, how to respect that, mm -hmm. how to take what they said, good or bad, and, and you know, value that person for their opinion and even thank them for their feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I got to, you know, do amazing things like skydiving, swimming with um, whale, sharks. whale sharks in the Philippines, mm -hmm. you know, in mm -hmm. South Africa, seeing the great white sharks. 
I mean, so many incredible experiences and, you know, going to Sahara Desert mm -hmm. and riding a camel, spending the night, being in nature, looking at the stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, just unbelievable experiences and getting to learn from the people who, you know, live in the desert, mm -hmm. who have never had an education in a school. Like, all they know is, here's what I know about a camel because I've observed the camel mm -hmm. and we need to do this. We need to give them water here, you know? Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at it objectively, you, you might even say like, oh, this person doesn't have an education. But they know so much. Mm -hmm. They know so much. They're an expert in their field. Mm -hmm. And just learning to appreciate the knowledge that different types of people have mm -hmm. and really evaluate like, what is an education? Mm -hmm. Well, everyone can teach you something. Mm -hmm. um, I, the biggest lesson I learned from traveling is that the world is not black and white. Mm -hmm. Black and white are, is very easy to define, to put into a box. Mm -hmm. You're either right or wrong, you're left or right. Mm -hmm. But if you even believe that there's black or white, you're already wrong because everything is on the spectrum. Everything is gray. Mm -hmm. And one person's idea is just as valuable as the next person's idea. And it's something you can't learn until you live it mm -hmm. and you see it. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, and wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> like you're saying, you know, these people in the desert who don't have a educational background, but have this really specialized knowledge of what mm -hmm. they do, cultivated from observation and probably knowledge being passed down also from yes. elders or other people in their community. Um, do you think uh, there's a significance in that? And do you think maybe today, because we have access to so much information that maybe at times we're losing some of that specialized knowledge where it's so hard to stick to one pathway or, you know, one subject or topic um, that, you know, information then becomes diluted. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if there's such like a, a, a pureness in, you know, growing up in a place and knowing this one thing so well. Right. And that relationship that you have with that, you know, whatever it is. Right. So, um, in that, in that respect, then it seems like we all have our, uh, relationship with education, our own relationship with education. And, um, how has that influenced, you know, your, your relationship with teaching mm -hmm. and, um, what you find important, um, in passing on to your students and yeah. So you know, going into the desert and learning from these people, I realized that maybe someone would say they don't have knowledge in all of these topics, but they know what they need to know for the life that they live. Mm -hmm. And they're happy. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's so many educated people in the world who aren't happy. And I look at these people who are living a seemingly very simple life. And they have all of their basic needs met, nothing more, nothing materialistic. And they are happier at times than I've been in my life when, you know, when I have lots of material things. And that in itself is a lesson. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really beautiful. And why should I input my belief of like, you should have knowledge of all these things on this person who's happy and knows everything they need to know. Mm -hmm. Why is my idea better? And it's kind of coming to terms with the way that we think about education. Does that need to be the way that everyone thinks about education? Mm -hmm. Or do we need to understand the needs of the individual for where they live mm -hmm. and make sure that they have the education needed to have happiness mm -hmm. in their life and be successful where they are? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that this really inspired me in my teaching um, to have the belief that there's a quote that goes along with it. Like, if you tell a fish to
to fly, mm -hmm. it will always believe it's stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to develop the strengths of our children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a fish can do amazing things. Mm -hmm. But if you say you need to be able to fly too, that's just impossible. But what about all of those strengths that that mm -hmm. fish has? Mm -hmm. And I think about that sometimes in just, you know, not focusing on the weakness, mm -hmm. but developing the strengths. Absolutely. Because that student may become, you know, the best scientist yeah. in the world. Yeah. And we don't need them to be, you know, uh, Carpenter, Carpenter the, exactly. The, the architect or something else. Exactly. I, that resonates so much because when I first started working with a Kahiao, um, one of the first things um, our director and my mentor, Julie, uh, asked me to do is to take this assessment to find out what my strengths are. And it was really insightful. Prior to that, I had always struggled really knowing like, what are my strengths? And I always used to think I had to develop my weaknesses, the things that I'm not good at, mm -hmm. right? So that they were better. And it's totally changed my perception of, you know, developing what we're already naturally gifted and talented at and bringing that to the table, bringing that to the group or sharing that gift. And so, um, since learning that, I feel like I focused on my strengths and it has been life changing in like all areas of my life. And that's uh, one thing that we um, do with our groups as well as students. Um, like right now, we had all of the students in, in, the, in the group that we're working with take this assessment. And so um, next week, we're, we're going to go over what the results were. And the idea of really focusing on that and working collaboratively as a team, right. instead of, like you said, asking the fish to fly, um, because that puts us in a position of feeling like, why can't I do this? Right. And so I feel like that approach alone is so valuable that I never learned growing up, that mm -hmm. I wish I had learned. Right, like I was taught growing up that I had to be good enough in all of these areas yeah. and it sounds like through this test about your personality mm -hmm. and your strengths you were able to focus on what you're naturally gifted at mm -hmm. bring your unique talents to the world yeah. and stop feeling inadequate yeah. which brings happiness yeah yeah and now you know in a group we can have one person that's naturally gifted in one thing and one person that's naturally gifted in another mm -hmm. instead of everyone who's good enough at all things. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it gives us a, a unique role yes. as well instead of butting heads about doing this or that. So um, that's beautiful. And do you, do you also talk to your students about strengths, their sh personal strengths? And Sure, I mean, just in, you know, if they're doing something and they have a really beautiful piece of writing, mm -hmm. I'll be like, wow, your writing is so creative. You're so detailed. Mm -hmm. You have an exceptional ability to explain things. Mm -hmm. Whereas another student is like, oh, I'm not that good of a writer. And I'm like, well, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. I'm like, you are an excellent creator you create art you create friendships you create connections mm -hmm. and when you tell students that they stop comparing themselves yeah. by this basic measurement mm -hmm. and start seeing like oh well they're a good writer and i can appreciate that yeah. and i don't have to be jealous of them i can mm -hmm. be like wow great writing mm -hmm. and then they can appreciate my contribution which might be my artwork yeah. or my creativity yeah. And so I think it, you know, in the classroom, just pointing out people's strengths mm -hmm. and letting them know that we don't all need to get 100% on our spelling test. Mm -hmm. It's okay that some person does and we should celebrate that. Mm -hmm. But just because you didn't doesn't mean that you're, you're not as good of a student. Mm -hmm. You have your unique talents and strengths. Mm -hmm. And when we come upon that, we're also gonna celebrate that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just like sparking 
that flame at a young age and right helping them hone that in for themselves right um so there's one other award i wanted to bring up um so there's the SEDI SETI mm -hmm. teacher award for sustainability yes. curriculum what did that entail so that was a lesson plan that I created with my fourth grade students in Flagstaff. And what we did was we started by learning about water. What's the availability of water on our earth? Who needs this water? So basically all non-ocean animals and humans. And realizing that water needs to be managed and used properly. Mm -hmm. So I had the students do something called a water audit. Mm -hmm. So they observed at home and at school how much water they were using without using conservation techniques. Mm -hmm. So how much water were they using, you know, every time they flushed the toilet? How, how much, on average, mm -hmm. did a student um, fill their water bottle mm -hmm. at school? and multiplying that by the number of students in the school. Mm -hmm. And we could even look at the cost of that water mm -hmm. because you know maybe someone who's into budgeting wouldn't be influenced by the amount of water, but maybe by the money. Mm -hmm. We're taking all considerations. We're trying to meet everyone where they're at mm -hmm. and get them to see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. They, you know, counted how many minutes they were in the shower at home, mm -hmm. how many minutes their family was in the shower, mm -hmm. and added that up. Mm -hmm. Realized how much water they were using, mm -hmm. and for a lot of them, they were blown away. Mm -hmm. And then we did something where we learned about the conservation techniques, you know? Turning off the shower in between, like while we're soaping up, mm -hmm. you know, um, turn it off while you're brushing your teeth. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And after teaching students about how to conserve water, which is basically only using what you absolutely need, mm -hmm. they redid the audit. Mm -hmm. So they did the audit at home and then calculated how much water they saved mm -hmm. in a week mm -hmm. and also how much money they saved mm -hmm. by using less water mm -hmm. and then presented that to their families. Wow. They did the same thing at school. They went around to the classrooms and created presentations about how to conserve water, created posters that they mm -hmm. hung around the school mm -hmm. and invited the other students in the school to mm -hmm. participate in water conservation techniques mm -hmm. and then recalculated the data, mm -hmm. saw how much as a whole, when the whole school participated, mm -hmm. how much that affected wow. the water usage. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really important because again, they're not just learning, they're sharing what they learned. Mm -hmm. They're teaching others about what they just got taught. Mm -hmm. So now they're the teachers. Mm -hmm. And seeing how they can manage their water usage, and they could extend that to, you know, a lot of other things mm -hmm. in the world about how can we manage our resources? How can we eliminate waste? Yeah. How can we recycle, mm -hmm. reuse, mm -hmm. reduce? Um, and, you know, students were amazed by the data, but I think the reason that I won that award is really because of the students sharing their mm -hmm. knowledge with others. Mm -hmm. And just imagine if each one of those students that they shared the knowledge with went home and shared that knowledge with their family. Mm -hmm. Now we've created a web where my one class is extended to thousands upon thousands of people in Northern Arizona, yeah. Yeah. saving water. Yeah. And I almost wish that we could do an audit and find out, hey, in that month in Northern Arizona, how much water was saved? Yeah. Because I bet there was an impact. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with one, mm -hmm. sharing that knowledge and extending mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So the award was um, for a sustainability company who I created that lesson plan, sent it in, showed them what my students had done. Mm -hmm. You know, we had water meters that the students were using and they were like, wow, mm -hmm. if only we could get, you know, all of Arizona to do this. Yeah. Would we still be in a drought? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my advisor in college said that, you know, all environmental problems are social problems. And that's something that always stuck out to me. And 
we, I've always pondered, even still to today, you know, how do we reverse some of the ecological damage that we've done? How do we change our behaviors mm -hmm. to, to create new impacts? And like even now with climate change, it seems like this huge um, problem, you know, like it's hard to know where to start, but I feel like that is a great example and demonstration of how, you know, you're building future leaders of tomorrow, yes. people that are conscious and aware of our natural resources, how to conserve them, how to manage them better in the future. Um, and when they share that with others, you create that um, that greater impact, that right. collective impact. And I, I feel inspired by that too, <laughs> yet again. Um, I feel like that's something that, that we can take on at home, at school or at work, mm -hmm. in our own community without relying on um, policymakers or top level um, decision makers to, to create that change for us. Right, we really have the power as the people. Yeah. We can implement those changes that we mm -hmm. want to see mm -hmm. and then share that knowledge so that others take action too, and it just creates a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, we actually, we did something very similar. We helped create a curriculum for third graders, and they did a, 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 a water audit, but on a smaller scale. And um, this was used at a school in Hilo, at YKL Waina. And I'm curious if he ever had them do a follow-up audit. I think that would be really cool to do just to see if they're able to save some water yeah you mean like the yeah. following year like did yeah. they continue to implement this yeah or even like you said after they learned uh, how you know how much water they were using they went back and did it again to see how much they were saving right well we did the water edit after oh, sorry water audit mm -hmm. again after they learned the conservation techniques yeah. Yeah. went and shared it with the other classrooms and then redid it. Right. But unfortunately, I left that school that year to move to California, mm -hmm. um, which leads me then to, you know, bringing that Native American lesson mm -hmm. that I created into the classroom in California. Mm -hmm. And I actually planned and organized and executed um, a week-long field trip to visit Native American sites in Arizona and New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So we got all the students in an RV and went to different Native American sites as a culminating end of the year character building experience. Mm -hmm. And we went to Pueblos mm -hmm. and learned firsthand from the people about how they honored the animals mm -hmm. and how they used the plants in their region and, you know, saw ruins like Wutpaki National Monument and it was just amazing to take what we've learned mm -hmm. and then see it in real life. Yeah. So it's really interesting because I wonder those kids now where they're at, if I could connect with their teacher and mm -hmm. say, do a water audit. Mm -hmm. Let's see what the impacts are years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that hybrid fashion of you know learning something in a classroom and then going out and actually seeing it for yourself mm -hmm. um, firsthand. I feel like that um, that's what creates the impact, is actually being able to uh, experience it. And being mindful of, you know, different learning styles. Yes. Like I myself is a, am a hands-on learner, mm -hmm. a kinesthetic learner, so I do not learn just from listening. Mm -hmm. I can repeat what you've told me, but it doesn't click mm -hmm. until I get out there mm -hmm. and get my hands dirty and see it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah, I'm also a hands-on learner, uh, definitely a visual learner. So mm -hmm. sometimes, same thing, hearing things isn't enough for me. Yeah. Like I have to be able to, to learn from making mistakes too and actually using my hands and doing it. Um, so to kind of wrap things up, I want to ask you a little bit about, um, so you've, you've started your own business, yeah. you're tailoring education to your students' needs. Yes. Where do you see the future of education, where we're at today, and what's, what do you think is going to be the best for students in the future? Well, I think that 
you know, with technology advancements, um, we can't resist that change. Mm -hmm. We have to embrace it, mm -hmm. but combine that with the roots. And when I say roots, you know, I'm thinking plants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking getting your hands dirty and having both mm -hmm. because technology is going to continue to advance, mm -hmm. you know, as much as we want kids to get outside, they're also going to want to be on their iPad. Mm -hmm. So making those experiences outside count mm -hmm. and making them be as meaningful and as impactful as we can mm -hmm. so that students, when having a choice, might choose to go outside mm -hmm. rather than have screen time. Mm -hmm. This is really important and that's now the challenge for educators to make sure that their hands-on learning, their outdoor education is equally, if not more so engaging than what students can find on the screen. Mm -hmm. And that's something we all are going to have to work, work on. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's something that your organization does really well. You get the students outside, you make sure that they have meaningful conversations, connect with the land. You teach them about the importance of Hawaiian culture, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. yeah, thank you. Yes, no, we definitely see the importance and the value in that. And everything we do revolves around nature, immersion, outdoor classrooms. And we learn so much from them. And like you said, it is a challenge for educators um, to equip ourselves differently mm -hmm. to you know be their guides through this time and to help provide that guidance um, as we move into the future because they are our are, are future leaders of tomorrow and right. I think that's a big responsibility on on educators and parents as well that um, you know is the change is is now and it's happening quickly um, with everything that's going on in the world. And I, I know if there's more teachers like you, Christy, mm -hmm. that our future is gonna be bright and oh, students okay. are, they're gonna be ready, you know, to take on and tackle um, whatever the future holds. Thank you, so I really appreciate that. I appreciate you and your, your conversation today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for what you do, teaching the kids and giving them experiences outside that are unique and special mm -hmm. and you know creating lifelong learners and lovers of the outdoors exactly yeah and i love sharing that with them I, I love kids they we have so much to learn from them if that's the one thing we've heard from them this last year it's they want adults to listen to them more and their thoughts are so valuable and more adults need to listen mm -hmm. to what they have to say and respect um, where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. If I can speak for some of our students and the kids we've worked with, that's been the number one thing. These students are open to ideas. Mm -hmm. They're innocent. And they they want are to help too. Right. They, they want haven't. Help. They. They haven't become bitter. Yeah. The world is still open and bright, and we need those minds mm -hmm. to guide us forward. Exactly, fostering their dreams and letting them know that they have support and you know we're here to help them find a way. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. And thank you so much thank for you watching. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Mahalo.